Welcome to A Few Minutes with FINRA. I'm Chip Jones. Today we will discuss FINRA's report on selected cybersecurity practices. Joining me are John Brady, FINRA's Chief Information Security Officer, Steve Polanski, Senior Director, Member Supervision, and Dave Kelly, Surveillance Director in our Kansas City office. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Good morning, Chip. Steve, I'm going to start with you. Why did we re put this report out at this point in time, and how is it different from the one that we put out back in 2015? We put it out, I think, because cybersecurity remains a, a very present threat when we talk to firms. Uh, that's frequently the, the number one threat they cite from an operational risk standpoint. And we wanted to provide more information to firms to help them protect themselves from this threat. So it's very consistent with a lot of the work that we've been doing over the years to get information out to firms. The difference between this report and the 2015 report is that the 2015 report is really about how to establish an overall cybersecurity program for a firm. This report looks at five specific areas, such as branch controls, insider threats, uh, penetration testing, to help firms understand how to address those specific uh, challenges. So one is a broad program, one is very targeted at specific uh, issues. Great. Uh, now, Dave, Steve mentioned that we, that we picked five topics to cover yes. in this particular cyber report. How did we pick those five topics? Well, we picked those topics based on what we're seeing as we're out there talking to firms. And, and we felt like that these were five areas that, a couple things. First, firms maybe struggled with a little bit more than some of the other areas. And they were also key uh, control areas for most of our firms out there. These five areas really had an impact on a lot of firms out there, and they're areas that they should really be focusing on, putting a lot of resources behind. Now, in addition to the five areas that are covered in the report, we also have an appendix uh, on the report, which is a core cybersecurity controls for small firms. Why did we decide to do that? Well, it, kind of in the same vein, we felt like that these were areas that as we're talking to these small firms out there, that they need to really be thinking about. Uh, they may not all affect every small firm, but they're firms that, are the, but they're areas that at least that they should be thinking about to see if they really have an impact on what that firm is doing. So if that small firm thinks about these areas, that's going to go a long way to having a good process and a good program for that firm. John, let me ask you a question. As FINRA's uh, Chief Information Security Officer, what keeps you up at night? So I've been in this role a number of years, Chip, and early on, I don't think I slept that well. <laughs> but now, you know, at this point, FINRA has a very mature and effective program. Staff across the organization are very security-minded and think about, you know, the risks of, of everything they do, every email they read and, and, and actions they take. Um, so in general, I sleep pretty well. There are a few things, of course, that, that concern me, and sometimes I'll wake up thinking about those. And really, those tend to be risks that are difficult for an organization to control. One example is third parties, so vendors or partners who have access to your systems or your data and are taking actions on behalf of the organization. You know, they determine security outcomes, and, and their processes and their security controls become vitally important. And as CISO, I don't have direct control over those. I have some influence. Um, but that is a, an example of something that will, will concern me and, and may wake me up in the middle of the night. Great. I do want to let you know there are cybersecurity vendors listed in our compliance vendor directory. These vendors provide services to help you with cybersecurity practices. While you're not required to use them, and FINRA is not endorsing these vendors, the CVD is another resource we have developed to help you find vendors to assist your firms. Okay, so let's start with branch controls. And Dave, I'm going to start with you. What are some cybersecurity risks we've seen at branches, and how are these risks different from those in the home office? Sure. So any firm that has a branch that's outside of the home office, whether it's just one branch down the street or hundreds of them across the country, it, they, they have risks because you have people at those branches doing different things and the home office may not have control or really knowledge about what's going on at those locations, especially if it's an independent contractor model firm. You know, at those firms, you know, those branch people, they're setting up their own equipment, buying their own PC, setting up their own server, setting up their own wireless network. And so 
that these are all things that the home office and that branch need to really understand how they should do that. You know, what the risks are with, you know, what data they have stored at that location or what, what vendor they're actually using. They, they may be using a cloud vendor to store some data for that branch. So one of the key things there is, you know, getting it all set up correctly in the beginning, but then also having a monitoring process that the home office can be involved with to monitor and really understand what controls are in place at that branch. Steve, are there, is, is there anything you want to add to what Dave said with respect to developing a cybersecurity program at the branch level? Yeah, I think picking up on, on some of the things Dave said, I think implicit in what Dave said is having policies and procedures that guide what the branch is supposed to do, what uh, members of the branch or um, registered reps at the branch are, are, how they can use their systems. I think having an asset inventory so that the firm knows what, ha what it has at the branch, what sort of applications are at the branch, what sort of equipment is there, what sort of customer data, that gives you a sense of what you need to protect. Then obviously there are specific technical controls and we can go into more detail on those, but things like protecting your, your network, uh, in some cases possibly disabling USB drives, sometimes people will store uh, customer information on USB drives and then they're easy to lose. Uh, and then, as Dave said, the branch review program so that the home office knows what's happening in that branch. Maybe one last key area for those branches is the training aspect. You know, what is the firm doing to help train those people so they really understand what they're supposed to be doing on an ongoing basis? So they're thinking about security at all times. Yep. John, how can a firm verify that patching of software uh, or machines is taking place at the branch level? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a range of approaches that can be employed from, you know, manual processes just to check system configurations, make sure automatic updates are turned on and that those things are working. That's at the, the low end of the spectrum. Reality is, though, even that is impractical for small firms, uh, small branches. Um, you know, when you get to dozens of computers, which likely have thousands of software packages on each of them, you know, the combination of things that need to be checked and updated grows to, you know, millions very quickly. Uh, so the most practical way is, is picking up on something Stephen said, is to have automated software that inventories the environment, finds everything that exists in that branch, whether it's a, you know, a web-connected TV to a computer on an associate's desk. Uh, and, and looks at all the components installed in it and checks to make sure they're up to date. That's really the only practical way to do that in this day and age. We're starting to see more and more tools out there that firms are employing to do that very thing. Yeah. You know, three years ago they didn't exist, yeah. or very, very few of them, but today there's a lot of those tools, and a lot of branches are using, or a lot of firms are using those to really help understand what controls are in place at the branch. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to phishing. And John, talk a little bit about what is phishing, and do we see phishing attempts here sure. at FINRA? We do, and I'll, I'll tell you what phishing <laughs> it's all about. So in general, phishing is about use of email to perpetuate fraud, whether it is to introduce malware into the target environment or trick a user into giving away sensitive information like their password, uh, or, or, or to convince them that you are a trusted entity and that and for them to do a fraudulent transaction on your behalf right like a wire transfer mm -hmm. um, and here at FINRA we do see these things and actually the, the trend is from general phishing which you know is where the attackers cast a very wide but poorly defined net across thousands of victims hoping to, to catch a couple of them the trend is now towards what is known as spear phishing which is where the attacker will pick a victim and they'll learn as much as they can about that victim, their role in the organization, who they report to, their day-to-day -day responsibilities, and they'll use that in the communication to build trust. And then once they've got that trust in place, they will attempt to achieve their, their end goal. Um, kinds of things we see here at FINRA quite often are um, attempts to redirect employee payroll, for example. So a fisher will pretend they are maybe a senior executive at FINRA uh, by faking the email addresses, but they'll direct it at a payroll staff member trying to convince them to make changes to that's, that employee's direct deposit. 
thankfully our, our payroll staff is well versed in these scams and we have other protections in place that, that help sh uh, reveal the scams before they bear fruit for the attackers. Steve, let me ask you, so for the firms that are out there, what are some examples of what they can look for to detect for phishing? So I think there are a number of things. Um, in some cases, these phishing emails have poor grammar. These may be more of the sort of broad stroke uh, phishing yeah. campaigns that John was mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, those, I think, are pretty easy to detect. But in other cases, you know, people are much more sophisticated. You can, for example, look at the email address of the person who's sending it to see if, in fact, uh, it, is, it is the person who it claims to be. So, for example, Dave here spells his name K-E-L-L-E-Y. If I were to get an email from Dave Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, being attentive to those differences in the spelling in, in, in names is important. Looking at the website addresses of, of uh, sites, if they're in the email, to see if they are, in fact, uh, accurately spelling the name of the organization they claim to be. Um, the folks are very tricky, so you need to be careful in looking at all of these things with, with some, some rigor. Now, Dave, what should firms be running, uh, or should firms be running phishing simulations targeted at, say, branch offices? Oh, absolutely, yes. Even small firms should be doing this, and we're seeing a lot more vendors out there that can do this for the smaller firms. Uh, for a very reasonable price. Uh, I, I think it's a really great way to, to train your reps and your employees about what to look for. John's team does it to us all the time, mm -hmm. and they've come up with some really good ones where you have to really think about it. And that's, that's the point of these, is really to you know, be helping test and train your employees. You know, if they, they click on one that they shouldn't have, you can you know, point them to some training or something like that to do. And, and Dave's team's always really good if you, because we have the button that says, you know, this is phishing. And yeah. so we click the button and they give us like a little right. yeah, gold, a little star, gold or star or something. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, you if you got it right. Yeah, exactly. And also if you got it wrong. Right. And if you get it wrong, we have, to go, we have to go straight, straight to training. To training, right. exactly. Right. All right, let's talk a little bit about insider threats. Um, Dave, what is the role uh, of compliance? with respect to a firm's information security program. Sure, and this applies really to any size firm or any type of firm. You know, the compliance group, they should be involved to help identify what those risks are to that firm first, and then what kind of uh, standards should be in place or what kind of testing should be in place to help make sure that your risks are, you know, being addressed for that firm. Um, you know, so we'd like to see when we're out there at any firm, uh, we'd like to see a, a risk assessment that's put in place and that identifies the risk, identifies what kind of testing is done to address the risk, what kind of controls are in place, and then who's responsible for that risk. And a lot of times it may be the compliance person, it may be somebody in operations, but it may be the IT person, you know, depending on that risk. But uh, that's, that's a key part, and compliance always should be in, you know, at the table when talking about these risks. Okay, Steve, what do we mean by internal threats, and can you give some examples? Sure. I think it's sort of what its name implies. It, internal threats are people or entities that have already have access to the firm systems. And so it can be employees, but it can also be contractors, part-time employees, vendors. So there are people, as I said, who have access to the firm system and essentially are, at least to some degree, behind the wall. So picking up on the phishing discussion earlier, if they're targeted, uh, they've already sort of circumvented some of the firm's defenses. And I think you can think of insider threats in sort of two categories. One, malicious actors who actually actively want to do harm to the firm. And then there are people who, perhaps through a phishing attempt, yep. become an insider actor or insider threat because of what they do, uh, but without a malicious intent. So you, you, you mentioned their malicious insider. John, what is a malicious insider? And, and how, uh, what are some tips for firms to identify these individuals? Yeah, well, thankfully, malicious insiders are rare. Let's start with that. Um, but generally, it's someone who feels they have something to gain given the access they have to a firm or an organization. Um, you know, it could range from somebody who's seeking 
um, financial gain. So they, if they have access to sensitive information that they think there's a market for, they might steal that and try and sell it. Uh, or they just may um, you know, be disgruntled. They may have been passed over for promotion and now you know, they're no longer loyal to the organization they work for and, and in fact are disloyal and want to do harm to it. We would consider that a malicious insider. Um, so it's a range of forms. Uh, in terms of, of you know, identifying insiders, so malicious insiders, uh, it, in a large, a large, uh, to a large extent, it comes down to behaviors, right? If some, if Dave was nice and friendly yesterday, but today he's a little angry and, <laughs> and, and you know, obviously uh, not a happy person, yeah. something must be going on, right? And so what we do here at FINRA is, as part of our program, is is to educate managers across the organization to be tuned into those things and to have a conversation with Dave. You know, why is it that you're upset? You know, is what's going on and get a good understanding of that and if it represents a risk to FINRA to to report that to insider risk program so that we can appropriately manage the risk for the organization we also use technical tools that monitor user activity on our on our network and access to you know sensitive data and if we see unusual changes so if if, if Dave for example has access to some sensitive information and you know he normally only accesses it once a month and now he just downloaded millions of records in the last hour, that's a change in, in pattern, which is potentially representative of malicious insider use. So our tools will alert us to those things. Okay. Let's move on to the next topic, penetration testing. And Steve, can you, what is, what is pen testing? Pen testing is uh, techniques to essentially test uh, firm systems for potential vulnerabilities. These can be testing of firms' systems from the outside, so potentially, for example, a firm's website to see if there are vulnerabilities that can be exploited uh, through the website. But pen testing can also take place internally where John might uh, have the pen testers look at some particular uh, tool that's open to, that's usable by FINRA employees to see if the controls that surround that use of that tool are vulnerable to exploitation. And there are several different uh, types of pen testing. There's something called white box pen testing where the entity that performs the pen test knows about the systems that they're supposed to test. There's a gray box pen testing where the, and the, the pen test entity knows something about the systems that it's going to attack, but not all of them. And then there's black box testing, which sort of gives, uh, simulates a situation where the attacker doesn't really know anything about the firm's system. John, so there are vendors or third parties out there that will help with, with penetration testing. What are some of the best practices for due diligence for using those vendors, not only for pen testing, yeah. but for in any, general? In, in general, yes. Sure. So we, as Stephen mentioned, I have a team of pen testers, but we also use third parties, and we use them for a variety of reasons. One, you know, to augment our own team, um, they have expertise in areas that we don't. They have tools and skills that, you know, that we just don't have access to. Um, but as part of that, we all, you know, what, what I know is pen testers, when they find a flaw in our system, that's very sensitive information. We don't want that, you know, just kind of shared because an attacker could then use that flaw uh, before we have a chance to correct it. So as we are going through the process of selecting pen test vendors, we do a lot of diligence on them. And, and we apply this to all the third parties that FINRA uses. And it, it really starts with understanding the engagement that the organization that FINRA will have with this vendor, uh, risk rating that engagement, because some things, you know, if it's like catering for a meeting, that's pretty low risk. If it's a, a pen test vendor or a partner who's going to have access, long-term access to sensitive internal data for data analytics purposes, that's very high risk. Uh, that then drives the amount of diligence we do on the vendors. And we look for reports, compliance reports, like SOC 2 reports from those vendors or ISO 27001 certifications. Um, we, if they don't have those, we send them these very lengthy questionnaires that are based on something called the shared assessments process. So sharedassessments.org uh, has information that, that 
firms might want to look at in terms of how they can conduct their own third-party programs, and it includes these, these questionnaires. Uh, so we'll go through this process and then make sure that any gaps that are identified are covered through contractual terms uh, so that our risks are protected during the whole life cycle of engagement with that vendor. Now, Dave, how often should firms conduct penetration testing and what should they do with the results of those of those tests? So it really, and each firm is different, uh, so it really depends on the risks for that firm. You know, for instance, what do they have out there on the internet that could be internet facing? What kind of internal systems do they have? Uh, what vendors are using? So there's a lot of different things, but and, and, so, but we we like firms to do it at least annually, uh, but a lot of firms we would push to do more more often than that. If they're doing a lot of changes to those online systems, you know, we may want them to be doing that penetration testing more often. You know, maybe even monthly if they're doing a lot of things out there and doing a lot of changes, and they have a lot of applications out there on the web. You know, I think that that's very important to be testing on an ongoing basis because the risks change on an ongoing basis. As you know, yeah. Yeah. every day there's new risks out there. And so they need to be thinking about that and what could affect their yeah. systems. Just, just to add a little bit about what FINRA does. So we do an annual test uh, across our whole environment, just a kind of a black box where we, we tell this pen test vendor, just scan everything, you know, mm -hmm. find every, every way you can try and get into FINRA. Uh, but then on every major release of critical applications, we do additional rounds of testing. So we might test an individual application five or ten times a year, depending on how frequent those releases are. Uh, so the diligence, you know, I think has to be, a, you know, a, to your point, right. change really is the determining factor of how frequently you should be doing these pain tests, pen tests. If you got a Call pain tests, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of, if you if you got a lot of change going on in your IT environment, a lot of new applications or new functionality within existing applications being rolled out, you want to test frequently. But then, just as important is the process that you go through after you get the results. You have to have a process of looking at those results, determining you know how how critical are the issues that are popping up, and fixing those issues. Having you know, having them scheduled and fixed internally, and then retesting the process and retesting those issues. So that's something that we always ask about, and it's almost just as important because you can't just do the test and throw the test results in the trash can. You've got to do something about it and fix it. So that's a key part. We have seen in times where they'll do a test, but then they maybe takes them a year to address a critical risk that turns up, and that's just not good enough. So that means you're open for that year. Year of somebody trying to break in through that risk that you have. So let's move on to the last topic that we highlighted in the report, which is mobile devices. And Dave, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how firms are handling mo mobile device threats, uh, such as lost devices and data that can be on those devices. Mm -hmm. Sure. So there's several different things that we've seen firms do. Uh, maybe they're using, you know, one good thing is there's software out there that you can get to handle those devices. Um, that so if you do have data so for instance if you're using email for, on your your smartphone or whatever that's that person has it's making sure that that data just stays in a certain part of that smartphone so then if that phone is lost or something like that um, that why, that data can be wiped out from an external standpoint but training is a big part of it uh, that everybody that has that has to really understand what their responsibility is to protect that data um, and then a, and another big piece of it is, you know, what kind of security do you have on that smartphone? So is there passwords required on that phone? Or can they just get on it, you know, uh, if anybody can get on that phone maybe and, and get to that data, and that's a bad thing. So there has to be a good password structure on that phone. So there are a lot of firms out there that allow individuals to bring their own device, right. BYOD. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that here at FINRA. Mm -hmm. John, what do we uh, have, what type of controls do we have in place in order to uh, control those BYOD devices and what should firms be thinking about? Yeah, so we do what Dave was just describing. So we have a secure container and it's, in, it's built via software. So there's a piece of software that if, if one of us wanted to participate in the BYOD program, we would get that piece of software installed on our phone 
and then it would give us access to FINRA's email and calendar and some other internal systems. Um, but the key point is it's a secure container in and of itself, that, that any data stored within it is encrypted separately from other data on the phone. And it can be wiped separately. So if, the, if Steve loses his phone, uh, he just calls the help desk, and the help desk can, can wipe the FINRA data off their phone. Won't wipe his data off his phone. If he wants to wipe his phone, he has to go through you know, whatever the carrier or the cell, cell provider uh, offers to do that. Um, but then on that container, we enforce a password requirement, as well as encryption of the data, and we prevent data from within the container from being moved to other applications on the phone. So you can't copy and paste data or save files locally out of this secure container. So it, it, it preserves this control of flow of information uh, by basically putting the perimeter within the phone. Okay, so let's, uh, just to wrap things up here, I've got, a, I've got a couple of sort of high level questions. And Dave, I'm gonna start with you. Um, we include a number of uh, suggestions in the report. Does FINRA have any plans in the future to uh, put rules in place to, uh, to, to require the, uh, the implementation of these effective practices that we've discussed today? No, we don't. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit, and firms ask me that question all the time. But this is an area that's changing on an ongoing basis, and it'd be really hard to write a rule that says, hey, you got to do these specific things. But uh, as you mentioned, we've put out documents, and this document has a lot of effective practices, so some things that firms should be thinking about. And if we go in and we're talking to the firm, we would expect them at least to be thinking about these things, and if it really applies to them, and the firm should be doing something in those areas to control and help protect their customers' data. And if a firm does have a breach, who should they who should they notify? Should they notify the customers, the FBI, FINRA, the SEC? Yes, there are several people that they should be notifying. Uh, first, probably is the FBI. They're the ones that are really good at it. They're really connected across the country. But you know, they there's no rule, but they need to be notifying us or the SEC. I think that's very important. If we start hearing the same thing across you know, a lot of different firms, we, we may put out a notice to saying, hey, we're seeing this as an issue out there. Um, and all these notifications that they should be doing is should be documented in their incident response program. Every firm needs to have an incident response program that really already outlines, hey, here's the phone number of the FBI and who you should talk to, or here's your coordinator's phone number for a FINRA or whatever. And uh, so that should all be outlined so you don't have to think about that ahead of time or you know, when the situation does happen because it's going to happen everywhere eventually. Um, you also talked about customers. Customers also need to be notified. You know, there's some processes you need to go through internally, but uh, you do need to notify customers if their data is involved in any threat or any breach. You, you talked about notifying the FBI, and, and as a general rule of thumb, I don't think firms, you know, have FBI on, on speed dial. I mean, right. uh, it was interesting, at one of our cybersecurity conferences, we had a, a, a person from the FBI speak, and mm -hmm. he said, reach out to your local office in advance and find out who in that office, you know, has, uh, you know, oversees the cybersecurity area. Is that, is that a good practice? That's a great practice to do. If you have those numbers and those people identified ahead of time, that way when you call them, they know why you're calling. Now, Steve, how important is it to educate customers regarding cybersecurity? We think it's very important because I think one of the vectors that we see for attackers to get into firms is through compromises in their customers' uh, accounts. So to the degree the firms can help uh, their customers become more cyber savvy, I think it's really, it helps the firm protect itself. And obviously it will help the, the customer as well, but really I think it's a measure that will, will help firms uh, as well. So it's not only educating everyone within the firm, the registered representatives, but also the customers. I think, yeah. The, We're yes. seeing more and more of the online firms doing that. So where they'll put information out there on their website about what the customer is responsible for doing. Great. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank each of you for being here today and for participating in this and joining me to share this important information. 
I hope you find this information useful. You can find the cybersecurity report and other resources on FINRA.org. If you have any suggestions for other topics we should consider for future episodes of A Few Minutes with FINRA, please send an email to memberrelations at FINRA.org. And as always, thanks for joining us and thanks for watching.